Good evening and welcome to all of our local community members that are participating from home or logged in on their computers uh, watching QAC TV. We want to start tonight by saying thank you to QAC TV for covering this event. It's taking place at the same time as our Board of Education meeting, so we appreciate uh, the work that QAC TV does. Uh, tonight's uh, economic development panel that we're hosting here at the Vincent Building uh, in Centerville the topic is what can the town of Centerville look like in the next five to ten years and tonight we've assembled a panel of subject matter experts uh, folks that have a lot of background in this area and in development project management you name it and um, we're just excited to uh, engage these three panelists that I have with me I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them uh, I'll start with Heather Tonelli to the far my far left the viewers right uh, Heather is the Economic Development Director for Queen Anne's County, and uh, her brief bio, as her preference was, uh, I'm at least able to add that she, like myself, is a Queen, Queen Anne's County High School graduate and a uh, local a native born and raised here in Queen Anne's County. Th uh, Heather, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for having me, and I'm uh, very happy to participate in this panel and happy to continue to support the town of Centerville. Um, and its economic development efforts. And I'll just say thank you for, for just all of your reaching out to us, uh, the county, through your office and, and other agencies, but your office in particular has been especially helpful and, and always willing to partner with us to, to strengthen our program and, and our footing, so thank you. Okay. Um, next to my left is uh, Davis C. Emery. I'm gonna read his bio. Davis was born in Baltimore where he attended St. James and St. Paul schools prior to graduating from Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia with a Bachelor's of Science degree in building construction and technology. Um, he's been involved in the construction and development industry for over 40 years and started with Emory Hill and Associates in 1982 working as a field superintendent, estimator, project and property manager. He handled the project management of Emory Hills, New Jersey projects, including a 600,000 square foot warehouse for Becton Dickinson in Bridgeport, New Jersey. He most recently completed the construction of a 105,000 square foot manufacturing facility for Master Halco in Edgewood, Maryland, and three 675,000 square foot spec cross docked bulk warehouses in Perryman, Maryland two 300,000 square foot spec distribution centers at the Riverside Development in Bell Camp, Maryland, and two office warehouse buildings in the Baltimore-Washington I-95 corridor, and an 86,000, uh, excuse me, 586,000 square foot warehouse in Carlisle, PA. He's a former board member of the Maryland chapter of the NAIOP, Burris Logistics, and West Nottingham County Academy, excuse me. Uh, he lives in Landenburg, PA with his wife, Judy, and they just celebrated, what anniversary was it? 35th. 35th. Uh, congratulations. Uh, where they raised three children, Clayton, Ashley, and Carter. Um, and so I will turn it over to you for any introductory remarks. Well, thank you. And, uh, yeah, that uh, introduction uh, speaks to, you know, things that have happened over that, that timeline. And uh, uh, I certainly... Uh, Want to preface that by saying I didn't envision any of those uh, huge boxes uh, arriving here in in, uh, in Centerville. So uh, I didn't want any of those uh, big numbers to freak anybody out. So. <laughs> but uh, thank you for having me here, and uh, look forward to, to the uh, discussion. Great, thank you. To my right, viewers uh, far left, uh, Pat Fox. Uh, Pat has been a Centerville resident since 2013 and lives in Symphony Village. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of Denver, a Master's Degree in Urban Planning from Ohio State, and a Certificate in Building Construction Management from New York University. Pat has enjoyed an extensive career in development project management spanning 35 years. Her project work has included transportation, rail lines and facilities, airport terminals, and road, roads and streetscapes. Her economic development experience includes preparing redevelopment plans and strategic recruitment, along with negotiating and managing the execution of commercial and mixed-use projects. As an active volunteer, Pat has served for six years on the Symphony Village Board of Directors, two years of which she was the chair of the <coughs> Symphony Village Committees. She has been an, a town council appointed member of the Centerville Planning Commission for seven years and spent a year serving on the Centerville Wharf Planning Committee. Pat served eight years on the 
uh, Plainfield Symphony Orchestra Board in New Jersey. Additionally, she co-founded and served for eight years in a leadership role with the West University Community Association of Denver, Colorado. Pat resides with her husband, with whom she has two daughters and four grandkids. Pat. Thank you. I have a couple of comments, so I'll just jump into this quickly. Um, as Eric said, I've lived in, in Centerville for nearly nine years and been on the Planning Commission for seven. One of my concerns in my Planning Commission time is that we have had only six mostly small new commercial developments. Uh, this is, includes the recent approval of the Taco Bell to be built on 213, adjacent to Dunkin' Donuts, which was another commercial project that came to us. We also approved the Auto Zone, the expansion of Ashley Storage, and the construct construction of a new flex commercial building that Davis owns at the end of course of all. Let's see. Okay. We also have had um, a an expansion of the cannabis operation over there at the on uh, Comet Drive as another one of a, the small commercial projects that we've done. At this moment, and Davis can be more precise about this, we have about 40 vacant acres plus in the Centerville Business Park that can attract commercial, light industrial, and retail development. Our town's lots that pay taxes, 83% are zoned residential, and only 17% are commercial. Some of us think that's a little bit out of whack. Therefore, the bulk of the town expenses and tax revenues are being board, borne by 4,800 residents. This includes, as only one example, the expansion and updating of our wastewater treatment plant estimated to cost $25 million. The town is doing a good job soliciting grant funding, but any excess is on us as well as the other town expenses. We have a great opportunity in available, developable land to bring more businesses, jobs, and real estate taxes to town. The 2015 Economic Development Report that the town had hired an experienced consultant to prepare um, made some very important observations and excellent suggestions, such as working with the Queen Anne's County Economic Development Office and Heather um, to bring investment and development to Centerville, the county seat. And also, and this is very important, to util utilize strategic tools to attract developments that are employed by many other governments in other states, a five-year graduated real estate tax credit. It's a very successful tool that Maryland and Queen Anne's County have enabling legislation. We can follow suit. And just a very brief description of what this commercial property tax credit is, to be eligible the property investment needs to be $25,000 or more in real property improvements and a minimum of 12 new full-time jobs created within two years as a result of the project. Now the credit is prorated over four years against the increased assessed value post the new construction. And the first year the credit is 80%, meaning that the owner would be paying 20% of the new assessed real estate taxes. And that graduates down 20% each year. So 60% year two, 40 year three, 20 year four, and then in year five, 100% of the new assessed uh, uh, real estate tax value would be paid to the community. This is a very, very effective tool that it would be great if Centerville was able to adopt. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, and thank for, for taking the time to put that together. Um, Pat and I have talked offline and the uh, tax credit uh, program that she has mentioned is something that I for one support as one of five members of the town council and it's something that I would like to see us present formally for the council's consideration in the near future and uh, as most folks know we, we need a majority to uh, adopt something and so we need two more members of the council minimum and uh, I, I'm hoping that we can get that um, I am your host this evening Eric Johnson uh, just a brief introduction um, 
I had the opportunity to work on a $2.0 uh, billion dollar, with a B uh, revitalization and development project in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which up to the time of the project had been in a continuous state of decline. Um, and we used a, a variety of approaches to revitalize that town, and it won lots of uh, international awards. Um, certainly didn't do that single-handedly, but I was on a, an extensive project management team and really learned a lot about the innovation that you can employ and that it's not necessarily complicated to try to address economic development needs in your community. Um, my background is I have a Master of Public Service and a Master's uh, in Public Administration. Um, I spent uh, several years in the Air Force and uh, after doing so moved back here to Centerville where I spent my teen years growing up. Um, so I'm not a native, but I'd like to think that I sort of am, am close to that point. Um, but I, I currently live here in Centerville with my wife and our, our three children. So. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to host uh, this panel tonight. We're going to jump right in with some questions. Um, and then for, for folks in the room, if they want to ask any questions at the end, we will entertain those. So we will begin with uh, a, a topic that is uh, not unique to Centerville, and that's the current tax situation. Um, I think just based on the current economic climate, both uh, locally, regionally, and especially nationally, um, folks are, are having a hard time paying their bills. And if you read social media pages here in the town and in the county, um, folks, you know, vent about their, their tax rates. Um, and they use a lot of colorful language if, if they live in Centerville. And so uh, we know that our uh, tax revenue is uh, not coming from predominantly commercial uh, developments, but residential. And so um, my question that we'll kick off with, and I'll start, uh, with Pat on this one. How can Centerville change its tax revenue from being predominantly residential? What are some of the, the tactics and strategies? Again, having um, a supportive local government searching for business opportunities, development opportunities, working closely with the county, working closely with Davis Emery to um, attract businesses to come in and make it a not an easy approval process, but to help get them through the approval process. Also, the town of Centerville has quite the opportunity with the one side of Pennsylvania Avenue at Water Street, which is vacant land that the town owns, that they could go out and find a developer to do a new mixed use project mirroring the other side of the street, where you have commercial retail on the lower level and residential units above. It, it, it adds an additional audience for downtown businesses when i was in planning school we used to call it new town in town and that's a great uh, development opportunity that the town would have total control over because we own the land so there's there's a lot of things to do but i think working especially with our developable land to attract more uh, businesses and again that that five-year graduated tax credit program that I mentioned that the county has and the, and the state has would be a very useful tool for town. Thank you, yeah. Pat. Uh, Heather, do you mind tackling that one as well? Um, sure. Commercial property tax base is important for a lot of reasons because the more commercial tax base that you have, the less strain there is on your infrastructure, your schools, um, health care, all those things because, you know, commercial properties use less and they're, you know, they're not putting kids in schools and that sort of thing. Not that is, any of that isn't good. It certainly is. Uh, but you would look at what the town currently has as far as commercial inventory. Pat talked about some of the vacant land and some of the potential there. Um, but there'd probably be a pretty easy calculation based on what currently is existing in commercial property, um, looking at what, what the potential could be in order to increase that value because you increase the value whether it's in vacant land or in improvements and that's where you can increase that tax um, so it is overall important for, for many reasons to increase that tax base um, because that also then in turn supports the services that the town offers offers and the um, various infrastructure needs that the town sees now great thank you um, i'm going to move on to the second question um, this one for davis um, so you as the owner operator developer for the business park at the southern end of town uh, right off of 213 um, what should the future of the business park look like what types of industry or business would be best for centerville in your analysis well we've 
the zoning of that land uh, being the, the PBD district is a very uh, uh, all-encompassing kind of use classification and it, and it pretty much uh, allows a, a huge variety of uses in there uh, which is a big plus um, the uh, We've not created uh, purposely. We've not gone in and just pre-subdivided the land into smaller lots, uh, trying to guess who might come along. We're, we're trying to keep things open and flexible for what might come down the road. Um, I think uh, the uh, the regional stormwater management is in place. Uh, it would be served by town utilities, which we would we've been installing in incremental runs as, as we uh, develop the road system in the lots. Um, I'm obligated uh, by 2025 of October to have the extension of Laser Drive put in, um, which uh, would be designed uh, to tie in with uh, the, the straight shot of course of all drive. It now enters into the land and goes uh, back to just kind of a dead end. That'll be a T intersection. At that end, and uh, so we're we're trying to uh, keep it open and flexible. Uh, we've you know sp uh, done some spec development, some speculative stuff on our own, just to try to spur activity, uh, trying to you know attract uh, businesses to the area. The um, what Pat has been talking about, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with, in, in some of the developments that you had mentioned. That I'd done in Harford County, we were developing an enterprise zones, which is another incremental tax structure, like like you've mentioned, where that's a, that's a ten-year program, where they're credited for uh, similarly with the uh, the size of the project, the amount of money spent, the number of employees, and then it's it's a it's a graduated scale for the uh, property taxes going forward. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Are there any enterprise zones in Queen Anne's County? We certainly do have one. It goes from the Bay Bridge up to Queenstown. Centerville does not qualify. They base that on socioeconomic um, demographics because we've checked into that. We only have two spots that currently within the, the county that qualify currently that we're planning to go forward with with municipalities up no further up north that have the the demographic that fit the qualifications for enterprise zone. And I, I would put, point out that the commercial property tax credit that Queen Anne's County does have in place mirrors the enterprise zone. It's just a much shorter time frame, um, and, it, and it doesn't have any job tax credit availability through that, although you do have to create jobs. And properties within Centerville could qualify for that, but it doesn't affect the Centerville portion of the property taxes only the the county portion of the property taxes so there is there is that um, benefit so getting back to the initial question um, if, if it were if I were king and had unlimited funds and unlimited uh, ability to you know attract anything and wave my wand you know I would love to see you know retail in the front of some sort whether strip center uh, fast food restaurants, uh, fast casual, possibly followed by hotel, followed by uh, we've had interest from assisted living, senior you know, living. We've had interest in there where uh, uh, unfortunately we just couldn't uh, get the uh, uh, the deal closed. The 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 operators either uh, couldn't get their financing in order or whatever. I mean, we were on a r really great fast track to get a project like that approved a number of years ago that unfortunately didn't materialize. And, you know, followed into the back portion of our property by, you know, smaller, uh, whether it be private businesses or, you know, single story, uh, it could be, uh, you know, whether it's veterinarian or, you know, medical use or, uh, I think there's even um, it would be allowed to have uh, a limited uh, residential, but I really don't think that's appropriate for that yeah. that area back there. So uh, again, we're just trying to you know be all things to all people that come along. Uh, Cushman and Wakefield out of Baltimore is the uh, marketing agent for for the land, and uh, and uh, Heather's been very helpful, and you know we. 
<laughs> sent things back and forth all the time. So I, I can't complain with the support that we've been getting from economic development. And, and even on our website, uh, the listing for the land and the uh, spec building we have up right now, it, it has the, Queen, the, the link to the Queen Anne County uh, uh, economic development page listing the, the credits and such. Pat, do you want to take that one too? I know Davis mentioned a lot of different options um, uh, for things that could move in. Would you add anything? Would you defer on anything? I thought his answer was terrific. Both of their answers were terrific. And any tool uh, that could be um, at our beck and call, we should capitalize on. And I feel strongly about that. And going along with that, we also need our own contact people within Centerville within this, whether it's town staff or even a private operation, but the town eventually does have to get involved. And I think that's really a, a key element that we're missing right now. So information can be shared, contacts can be made. Um, I think that's really important. You're here. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Um, towns that are sort of closed in on themselves when it comes to their uh, programs and economic development. Um, probably don't fare well and so we we want to think beyond ourselves and and we do partner with the county we do partner with other organizations the town does get a lot of grant funding from the state um, and it's it's been eligible for and has received federal grants um, but thinking today and thinking on the immediate horizon and, and as we indicated in the title of this event the next five to ten years um, the question would be how can the Centerville Economic Development Program benefit from external resources such as Queen Anne's County's Economic Development Program, the Chamber of Commerce, all the other resources out there. So uh, we'll start with uh, Heather specifically. I know you've kind of touched on some of this stuff, but anything else that you'd want to add? And uh, then we'll turn it over to our sure. other two panelists. Sure. Um, we are happy to assist and play a role in the economic development within the municipality Centerville, as well as any of our, our towns. Um, when you look at our comprehensive plan, the, the, the county's comprehensive plan, which, which was just completed in 2022, um, it's clear that there is a focus on potential growth up north. Understanding that that vision specific to every municipality comes from the town. You know, it's not a county decision as to what goes here, it's, it's the town. Um, we have met with your town administrator and staff and and they are happy to to have our support um, we've even a couple times brought in other or other state partners to kind of tour the town to look at what programs are available your sustainable community there's great grant programs available there especially on uh, redevelopment and demolition and things that might need to be done in order to you know bring properties up to new what they could be potential um, so we are, are definitely here to help and want to help. Um, for us, uh, the product that Davis has is not our only product, but it's one of our major products that we have to offer when a business comes to, it comes in. We are focused primarily, my office, not necessarily on housing, more so on commercial development, industrial development, job creators, um, also, you know, um, quality of life things for sure. but. Um, Davis, it's a great product there. Um, he's got some um, mixed or flex use there currently um, that we do whatever we can to help market it. But we, we are definitely here to support. And we definitely feel that. Thank you very much. Would you want to add anything, Davis, to that? Yeah, I, I think it just, uh, it's helpful to, you know, when we do get an inquiry on the land or the use and uh, the question always comes around to, well, you know, uh, we're looking at, you know, doing something out, you know, in a year or two, do you th think that's going to be an issue? Uh, you know, how is the town to work with? You know, those mm -hmm. questions always kind of, what's the permitting process like? What's the timeline for approvals? Those kinds of things. And uh, the more that, um, I can, you know, get the assurances and uh, through economic development's help and just contacts you know, in the county, knowing that that there is there is a kind of a measurable timeline where you're not just being strung out endlessly on some of the western shore counties. I mean, you're, you're, it's years, you know, to get something 
through approvals, and, and this is on something that's, you know, it's a buy right use, it's a already subdivided piece of property, it's, you know, you look at it, you think, well, it's teed up, ready to go. Yes. It, I'm putting on here exactly what fits, I'm not, you know, bending any rules or, or trying to, you know, uh, offset anything, you know, and, and it just, it's just the process is so laborious and expensive. Um, I really, um, unless someone really wants to be there, I mean, it. I, I can't see how some people get deals done over there. That was one of the things that attracted me over here. Not that not that Queen Anne's County and Centerville were a bunch of pushovers. I mean, certainly not. But I think there there's a there's a process, but it, it's measurable and and it's not. You, you, you know, there's certainty to it, which which is very important to any any user that you know wants to invest here. You know, uh, base of business here. They they want certainty that you know I'm not going to get jerked around. I'm not going to get feed to death. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm going to know what the process is and I'm going to know the timeline. So I think that that's an important aspect of you know working with uh, economic development and, and the rest of the of the county. So, uh, but yeah, so far uh, when somebody's come in and, and it's rolling, the uh, the Taco Bell is a, a good example. They've uh, you know, been through the process, and you know they they what they initially thought it would take. It's pretty much taken that amount of time, about a year, to get through all the approvals. Thank you, Pat. Would you like to add to that? Uh, no, we can go on to the next. Thanks. Got it. They did a great job. Those two. <laughs> all right. Um, the next topic um, talks about the vehicle itself uh, that the town is using. Um, uh, years ago, I had the opportunity to serve on uh, CETA, the Centerville Economic Development Authority, and I know for a time there was a challenge with being able to maintain a quorum, and ultimately the town council, um, prior to myself uh, serving, uh, elected to pause CETA uh, for an indeterminate amount of time, and uh, in, in its current form, it is still paused. Uh, I happen to be the town council member that is appointed to be the liaison for economic development, one of the reasons that I'm hosting this uh, panel here this evening. Uh, but the question has come up, do we consider uh, privatizing such a thing and, and doing things similar to what the city of Easton has done uh, with, I believe it's the Tread Avon Foundation, um, other municipalities where there's a sort of hand-in-hand -hand partnership between uh, government side of things and then a potentially privately organized uh, organization centered around economic development. So my question is, um, is, is that an acceptable approach? Uh, is it something that we should take a look at privatizing efforts? Um, is it something that we should steer away from? So Pat, do you mind if I start with you on that one? Sure. I think that there's been plenty of time just in my tenure of attempting to do economic development or at least talking about it. We had a part-time person and that position is no longer filled in the town of Centerville. Um, I think that it's a, it's a critical position to put ourselves in to be organized with our thoughts and organized with our actions in terms of, of different forms of economic development. And because of limited town resources, maybe the very best way to do this is to have a, a private nonprofit um, uh, organization to explore that because you know you need a, a certain skill set to do this effectively you need the enthusiasm to accomplish it um, otherwise you know I hate to say it but I don't want us to drift any longer when there are opportunities I mean think about um, well, I think they call it the Delaware flyover when they connected 301 via the toll road to make it uh, all the way to to one and to the bridge um, to you know detour some of the traffic off 95 and it comes down 301 it goes up 50 to cross the Bay Bridge that's a lot of, of additional traffic coming through and interest in this area and Centerville is is ripe for you know action and we need to have somebody that can recognize it uh, and capitalize on it. Would either of the two of you like to take that one? <laughs> um, I would. I would just say I've seen both models. I've worked in both models before, um, and there's benefits 
whether it's government-based, quasi-government, or privatized, a lot of it has to do with the ongoing funding. And, you know, when it is privatized, usually it's somewhat still funded by the government in some way, shape, or form, which, you know, is fine. Um, and I would say that you do have, through the economic development plan that Pat had mentioned, that was done in 2015. You know, it doesn't talk about privatization, but it talks about, you know, the potential of utilizing our resources through our department, through the county, as well as potential part-time. Um, it's certainly an option. There's cer many models to look at, you know, even on the Eastern Shore to kind of gauge. And I would also mention, you know, that you do have a Main Street program, which also offers significant funding and is a focus within whichever the Main Street boundaries are. Um, but they're, you know, that's their job as well, and they do a pretty good job, a, a great job, of supporting the local businesses in town. And I'm glad you met, mentioned the Main Street program, Heather. Um, Carol Diagostino, of course, is our Main Street program manager and, and just does a phenomenal job. Uh, we have facade grants, uh, a, a host of other projects that she's engaged with. And uh, when we think about the, the non-business side of uh, economic development, the, the events, the, the uh, programs that take place on an annual basis that bring the community to better, uh, together, excuse me, uh, like Drink Maryland and Centerville Day, and other things um, so that is something that we need to make sure that we're always celebrating and capitalizing on um, uh, any cautions that you would say just based on your experience Heather if we if this community was to look at some sort of hybrid model and, and I almost envision a scenario where it was a kind of three-legged table between our county partner through you and and Linda from the Chamber of Commerce um, the town itself town government and then if there was a privatized privatization effort that, that were to emerge, um, that's the triad right there. So just any lessons learned for anybody out there that's thinking, yeah, I would like to see that happen, that you would just say, be careful. Um, the only thing I would say is however it was set up that they were able to actually do something. If it's not, if it's not set up that they don't have authority to have action, then it's, yeah. I mean, you're going to end up in the same spot that you did with CETA with lots of great intention and, and persons that wanted to be involved, but it's really a, a voice more so than an actionable committee that's able to, to do something. Davis, any thoughts on? Uh, I've, you know, kind of worked with both over the years, and, you know, it seems like as long as it's effective, you know, that I'm supportive. Yeah. That's key. Got to have teeth, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so what are some of the innovative ways beyond what we've already talked about that the town of Centerville can incentivize new businesses to be successful? Um, lots of things that have been put out there tonight. Is there anything else that, that we should consider? Um, I'm going to start with Davis on that one. Innovation, uh, things that you've seen in your experience where you went, wow, that was a really creative way to instigate that project happening or that interest materializing. Yeah, there. Some of the uh, uh, again getting through the uh, approval processes. There, there was a time uh, during some of the economic lulls, and, I, and I'm sure it was due to just lack of projects to review that they would they would uh, you know offer an accelerated program you know for getting approvals you know through, um, and it was uh, uh, I can't remember if it was. Um, Howard County or uh, Baltimore County, but um, some of the agencies were, you know, their, their timelines were, if you qualified that and you were put on this fast track program, you know, your your review times were shrunken. You know, you were you were supposed to get comments back much sooner okay. than the uh, you know time normally allotted, and it kind of sped the process up. Um, you know, you know, when everyone was kind of, you know pulling on the oars in the same direction and you know wanted to see a project get through it it it, it, it developed it, I, I found it to be very effective because it involved the user as much as anything in that they said look we really want to expedite this can you make a meeting I'm gonna have the planner here my, my uh, you know municipal uh, manager here and he's got questions can you have your guy you know come in and, and do a face-to-face -face? And, and that was really effective because everyone kind of you know okay you're everyone's for real you're really trying to help and, and we're gonna you know, here's what we're gonna do and uh, as opposed to you know sending plans in 
you know, waiting for the allotted, you know, two months to get comments back. Then the comments come back, and then there's the arguing period of, you know, well, why did he, you know, why are we doing that now? You know, how come we have to do that? And it, it's, it's just a lot of wasted time, this back and forth period when um, you just feel like, you know, folks, can't we just get on a, you know, direct line of communication and, and figure this out and, and get going? So, um, um, I, I know in other jurisdictions it's it's difficult. Um, in Delaware, you're, you're very limited. Um, all this, all the roads in the state are controlled by Del you know, unless you're in a established, uh, you know, town municipality. And and we've had, you know, just endless, you know, uh, review periods and delays, waiting for them to get through their process just to get an entrance, you know, onto a road and. Uh, um, I, and it and it's terrible in that you you know then you have to hire attorneys and it's the one that you know has access to that certain person that will yeah. take the call and you know you just hate you know kind of these inward you know gameplay uh, roles where you know, you know can't we just you know all figure this out I mean it's not that difficult I mean you wouldn't think so um, it is such a game <laughs> it, it can be and 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 a needless game sometimes yes. and, and i i get it but it, it uh um i'm not trying to you know poor me you know look, look at all the <laughs> all the hassle i gotta you know deal with but it it, it does help um it, as far as innovation in in, in, that, in that kind of approach um i i would say i know when we had the uh, assisted living uh to, uh, operator trying to you know establish this pr this project on our land they they were just overwhelmed with how quickly they were able to get through reviews and hearings because it was obvious the town was very uh, anxious and, and really wanted a project like that here so there was uh, no opposition and they said we'll do anything we can to help and expedite this and I mean he, he kept apologizing to me at the end when when he just said I, I can't honor the contract and uh, purchase the property he said he said it wasn't anything you all did he said I couldn't believe the town how, how well they responded and how quickly we were able to get our approvals done and uh, you know address any issues they had with what we were you know planning to do so um, that if nothing else that whole experience you know I kind of remembered that I said okay I can I can tell anyone else that comes along look you know I've had some other people go through this process and they were dumbfounded at how quickly and how responsive you know, everybody was to their to their needs and, and getting their approvals taken care of because in other jurisdictions they were talking you know he said my god it took me you know two and a half years to get a project approved you know somewhere uh, in uh, Montgomery County or something he said it was just endless he, and and he was you know just expecting a big fight <laughs> and he said my god they really want me to be here don't they I said yeah so I was on the planning commission yeah. during that project proposal and one of the council people Jim Beecham was really strongly supportive of that project and it was actually a delightful project to work on via the planning commission members um, and we were all so disappointed when the uh, proposed developer had to withdraw. I'll tell you, um, about a year and a half ago, I called him. I said, any chance you could resurrect? We could mm -hmm. still use that development. Land's still there. Bring your old drawings <laughs> back. Uh, but he couldn't do it. Yeah. And it was uh, very, very disappointing because, quite honestly, to have a development like that adjacent to Symphony Village, I even said to uh, the proposed developer that you don't know how many Symphony Villagers you have missed not being able to build out that project yes. um, that you know folks that now need assisted living or even the memory care wing that they were planning on so um, yeah that 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 was a great possible project yeah. well, it sounds like that's an ambition that we maintain uh, for the business park and for the town um, and what I'm hearing loud and clear when we we think about the experience that developers have had with the town of Centerville is whether we advertise it or not, we have, uh, by comparison to other jurisdictions, a, an accelerated path. And so it could be one of the simple solutions that we have right in front of us is to sort of codify that in some sort of marketing materials to say, hey, this is your estimated time frame for each of these steps, you know, subject to variation that can occur, of course. But 
um, and then to lean on our county partners and, and others to, to help us spread that word. Because um, I'm guessing, you know, you're a developer, when, when you're looking at potential communities for a project and you can find a community that it takes a quarter of the time or half the time and you're weighing different options, you're probably going to take the path of least resistance. Well, yeah, it's that old you know, adage, time is money, and, you know, you're putting uh, money at risk, uh, you know, tying up land, you know, going through the approvals, um, and you know, unfortunately, I'm afraid we're kind of heading into a, some economic, you know, uh, slow times here. Unfortunately, and it seems like uh, you know, you always risk missing that cycle, and uh, so it, it's always better to have things you know, move along ex expeditiously and get your you know, project in the ground and, and going. Uh, you know, as, as quickly as possible, it, you know, it's less risk for sure. So um, that's innovations. Um, other things that can be done, uh, which sometimes um, attract interest would be uh, in the fee departments, if there's uh, connection fees, um, permit fees, those kinds of things. Uh, I. I, I knew uh, one township in New Jersey, uh, they, they would, you know, gradu they had a gradual scale to pay out, you know, a connection fee, you know, through your utility bills, that kind of thing, and not just hit you with a upfront charge, you know. Um, and um, that sometimes, you know, it's all helpful, but it, that I've never had it where I said, boy, I'm going to come here because, you know, I know I can you know get a break on my utility bill or something but it uh it, it it never ceases to amaze me the the all all the matrix that are used for various businesses that you know why I want to be in a certain place and why I I can't be in a certain place and it can be anywhere from transportation costs to labor costs to you know um you know, just being close to you know a main you know, supplier, that kind of thing. You, you just never know what, what drives someone to an area. And uh, uh, 20, well, heck, yeah, almost 20 years ago, what brought us here was uh, the uh, social services facility that we, that we leased to the state of Maryland. And that was just answering an RFP that was on their website and knowing that this land was available. Um, that's what kind of brought us here in the first place. Okay. But... Um, we we have other developments uh, on the eastern shore. Uh, most of them, though, are residential. Um, so the, the closest here geographically are, are uh, apartments that we have up in Chestertown. But um, the uh, uh, yeah things like that fees, restructuring fees, uh, expediting approvals, uh, reviews, that that kind of thing. I, I think it's always it's always good and helpful in sure. moving projects forward. Thanks, Davis. Um, Heather, can, do you want can to Can I say amen to that? Yes. Uh, I do know that for sure that when companies are initially looking around, it's not the incentives that bring them to Centerville or, or anywhere. That's going to get them to the finish line, but to the start line when they start to look, they're, they're looking at demographics, many, many things before they even consider um, even what the town has to offer as far as expedi expedition of um, processes that sort of thing but all those things are super important and that holding cost of time for a developer to have to hold the land if there's something that they can do to, to move that along but so I wouldn't count Centerville out just because there might not be this big pot of incentives sure they help but it's going to be more so that you know business sees value in your location and then once they're here, it's it's my job, it's our job to roll out the red carpet to walk them through the process, so that they grow and love Centerville just like we do, and exactly. get them here. So Heather, thank you for that, and I'm going to tag you for this next question to start us off. Um, we know that economic development uh, is more than just uh, jobs and and bringing businesses. So, um, in what ways do arts, culture, and history? Uh, play a role in economic development, and uh, are we leveraging these sufficiently? What are our opportunities? So economic development, I feel, touch, touches on all parts of quality of life, why somebody wants to live here, work here, start their business. It's all about the, the culture and the, the, the way Centerville is. You know, each town has a certain uniqueness. Um, I would also say that tourism is economic development. 
and culture and heritage and arts all play a huge role in that. People are looking for experiences. Um, sure, it'd be great to have a few more places to shop in town as, as a draw to, to have something to do while you're here, but many people are looking at the history and enjoy the house tours, whether they're at Christmas time or the one that's coming up or um, want to go see local art or performances, that sort of thing. They're, they're key. They want to feel like they're a part of your community when they're here, visitors, um, and, and immersed in the culture and, and art and history. Um, and then many times we find that those people come back several times and then want to move over here. We, we all know that. There's many um, here today that that's exactly what happened. You know, they came over for fun uh, or for a vacation or to, to visit, and now they, they are back and they're living here because they, they want to be a part of it. So it, it's super important, you know. Um, affordable housing, workforce development, uh, community development, all those things touch on what's going to make a person's life better and, and how do we help make that happen. That one too, Pat. Yeah, um, I think that the whole topic uh, presents a huge appeal for this community. Um, this is my favorite brochure that I've seen since I've li been living in Centerville, the Heritage Walking Trail. There are 26 different sites in the community that have a historic or cultural story to go with them, and it's just a, a terrific guide to make your way through Centerville. Um, and um, we just mentioned the House and Garden Pilgrimage, which is coming up on May 13th. And I think that's like the snappiest title I've ever heard, a pilgrimage. I think that's wonderful with uh, numerous sites around the county, but also in Centerville. Uh, we, and I feel strongly that we should encourage say B and B development, bed and breakfast development in the town, because then you can accommodate your your tourism, your your visitors. They can come here and stay and do the walking trail, rent a kayak down at the wharf park and go out on the Corsica. Come to drink Maryland, go to some of our other events as well and our, our Sunday farmers market. Um, that we just on the planning commission just approved one property being used as an Airbnb rental. Um, that's not really a bed and breakfast, but it's akin to mm -hmm. that. It provides an opportunity for people who are visiting to have a place to stay. But I, I just think that, um, like Heather said, it's just the, the culture and the history of a place. Every place is unique, and you want to tap into that attraction. Absolutely. Um, so how do we foster entrepreneurial spirit and other ways to potentially incubate or help start up in small businesses? Davis, from your background and some of the projects you've worked on, um, any lessons learned? Uh, we're, <laughs> uh, we, we do certainly uh, deal with, with startups. Um, you know, we, we want to know that, you know, the, the business plan is solid and, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, we certainly want to see succeed because whether we're selling someone that property or leasing, you know, to somebody, we want to know that they're credit worthiness and they're going to be able to pay the rent that, uh, exactly. that we agreed to and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, we're, um, I mean, it's one of the things I've enjoyed the most in, in this line of work in, in that you just deal with so many different you know, people and so many different businesses that you would have never, you know, had any exposure to otherwise from um, uh, food production, pharmaceuticals, electronics, uh, just, you know, straight up uh, warehousing, uh, medical uses. Um, but um, we, I think that... Um, it, it's it's a it's a fine line. I, I know some of the other developers that uh, that, I'm, that I have um, compete with on the Western Shore. They they've set up uh, blocks of space, incubator space, work uh, workspace uh, development, that kind of thing. And I, I I don't. It's hard to gauge how successful that is. I mean, you, you always hear the few stories of the startup that you know you had that little. You know, block of space, and either the we work or the, uh, you know, the, the couple group of offices, and now they own the entire building. You know, that kind of thing, and uh, th that's uh, that's a great story. I, I just don't know. 
or can't claim that I've, I've I've been blessed with having that kind of a experience with some of these folks. It, 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 there's the alternative where you know things just don't work out and they kind of throw the keys on the desk and and vanish on you. So, um, well, uh, it, I, I think it's um, it, it it's tough for me to to judge. You, you know what it, and. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not opposed to that. It's just, uh, you know, I want to know that whoever we agree to do a, a lease with or a deal with, that you know, that they're going to be successful. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll listen to anybody's business story. I mean, if they think they have a, you know, a better way to do something. I'll certainly will, you know, work, try to work with them. Here, here, Heather. What are you thinking? Uh, we have a lot of resources within our county and within our re uh, region. And what's most important is making sure that our entrepreneurs or those looking to start up know about what those resources are. Um, I'll just mention some of them quickly. The Small Business Development Center is located at Chesapeake College, and then they have places throughout the, throughout the nation. Um, that's a great place to start. They help you with business planning, projections, financing, legal issues, what, whatever you might need. That's a great place to start. There's also Service Corps of Retired Executives. Um, there is also, through Upper Shore Regional Council, a pool of retirees with uh, specialty backgrounds that are looking to help mentor businesses that's going to be up and running soon the why our new why is going to have some sort of resource center i'm not exactly sure of all the services that they're going to offer um, we're, we're happy to take any calls no matter where they are within the county or, or where they're looking to to start their business within the county to talk to us first we can tell them about the resources um, and the last unique opportunity is project restore which is a state grant uh, that our, our previous governor had initiated. Some of it had to do with COVID, you know, trying to backfill um, vacant space. And that has been extremely successful. We've had several rounds in several Queen Anne's County uh, businesses participate. And that should be open again in July. And that's a great opportunity to kind of help pay the rent, get it started. There's some operating monies there. Um, but there's, there's all kinds of resources. Are there grants for for-profit businesses most likely no i mean there are a few we we have one program but i wouldn't count on that but there are loan programs and there are ways to get started um you just have to want it exactly mm -hmm. in our uh the 2015 economic development report uh there's a discussion of helping entrepreneur entrepreneurs and and having an incubation space i've seen empty commercial buildings turned into an incubation and startup spaces for small businesses and this program is supported by colleges and government agencies. And the one case I'll tell you about in just a moment, the businesses, the startups are provided with space facility support staff and when they reach a certain a threshold of revenue and staffing, it's their turn now to go out into the real world and get their own space. In New Jersey, in the city of Camden, there was a hospital that was no longer going to function as a hospital, ER only. And the state and Rutgers University turned it into an incubation space. So the small businesses that would come in, they would be um, assigned, every, everybody had a, a shower and a bathroom because they got the, the rooms that, you know, previously patients had been in. And then the nursing station was um, for the receptionist and the office equipment and the like. So they were able to have those spaces and start up and and live in the, live in there operate in there at a very small fee and then move on out and they had an exceptional success rate and you have but you had that building that was sitting there empty so exactly. they were able to do that and it was it was really impressive and what you'd find is that businesses from North Jersey would um, pay to be able to use that location as a uh, Southern Jersey uh, address so they would have you know workspace there and could get their mail there so they'd have a couple of locations for their business but I mean I'm not saying that we could do something of that scale here but it's it's an interesting concept yeah. you know and that's the key we, we need to be creative think outside the box and and we've got Chesapeake College University of Maryland you know maybe there's something you know for the county countywide so um, we've talked a lot about uh, things that maybe not they're not here yet, but we want to bring them here. 
um, things that we can do to attract folks. So let's talk for a second about um, our existing business establishment. Uh, we know part of economic development is the viability, the continued viability of our existing business establishment. So uh, what can we as Centerville do better or diff differently to support the existing business establishment? Heather, I'll start with you. Any thoughts there? Um, I, I, as I mentioned before, your, your Main Street program, that's part of their model. And, um, you know, I'm sure Carol is out. You know, and I see I've seen her walking the streets and visiting with the businesses. That's super important. That's our job as uh, Queen Anne's County Economic Development, staying in touch with your businesses. It's business retention, making sure that they have what they need to be here and or grow. Um, it's it doesn't take a lot of funding to do those sort of things. It mainly is just most important that they know someone cares and that they're important to the business community. Um, but you know, every I've been in several different economic development jobs, and that is 101 to maintain your existing businesses, and that's where you're going to see your growth is through those businesses. Sure, we want some new ones, but you've got to keep your base healthy. Exactly. Because otherwise, you know, it's just going to be backfilling one with another with another, and then are you really growing? So this focusing on those existing businesses is really important. Perfect. Thank you, Davis. What are you thinking? Well, I, I would share her, uh, Heather's comment. I, I think that's important. Um, you know, everybody's so busy, uh, you know, trying to run their business. I'm sure a face that kind of would kind of represent the town coming in and saying, you know, what, you know, what would you like to see? Uh, you know, do you need help with anything? Do you have any you know, issues with this location or, and it could be anything from, you know, if that sidewalk out front, you, you know, it could be, it could, is that, you know, is that my responsibility to fix that? Or is that the town's responsibility to fix that? Or, you know, this road is really rough or, you know, can we you know, do something about the, uh, you know, there's a dead tree, there's this, there's that. It just, it just that it's, it's little things like that. But I, I think that makes a difference uh, to a business owner that, that, you know, someone from the town is actually asking instead of you just picking up the phone and complaining to somebody and many times I don't think a lot of people are so busy they don't know who to call they don't they don't know I I mean a perfect example I and and I'm not trying to single anybody out but I you know I had a boomerang email that came through to me about the stop sign that got twisted in the wind I think or got hit down by the Dunkin Donuts and and of course you know it went it went to the county and then it went to the town and then it went and uh, then Chip found it, forwarded it to me and said, you know, can you, ta I said, well, no, hold on. I said, number one, wh what stop sign are we talking about? I don't even know which <laughs> we're, is this, you know, a, one that I installed or one that belonged? It, it, so it, it all came around and it was literally at the last meeting when we got together there and I just told the manager, I, I said, look, okay, I see your stop sign. Can you please fix it? Because it's, and and so it's fixed you know but it, but it was just kind of comical to me that it had to be right kicked around room. through so many different people <laughs> to, to finally you know find the right person i said it's their stop sign someone go in there and tell them can you please fix your stop sign <laughs> so it was just but i i didn't take offense it, and, and and i kind of felt like okay i'm, I'm kind of the face of that property so mm -hmm. they figured i would know who to ask or or who to talk to so but um no, I, I think those those touch points are important, um, which should be expected in in, a, in kind of the small town environment. I mean, that, that, I think that's what attracts some people to this environment is that they're not just someone in this big urban area that's just another number. Well, and I thing. I have a story that sort of backs that up, and then we'll get uh, Pat's thoughts on this. Um, Centerville Day, we we rely on local local businesses to to sponsor the event through cash donations and in kind support, and. Uh, I, I try when I'm getting a pizza for my family and maybe it's not ready yet, then, you know, I am on the council, so I want to take time to, to maybe walk a couple stores down and, and say hi to somebody, see how they're doing. And uh, I won't say which business establishment, but I had gone in and, and talked to somebody and I said, how are you doing? Is there anything that we as a town could do better or differently? And this person said, you know, um, it's the first time anybody's ever asked me that, and that, that was sad to hear that answer. What was good, and this illustrates the point that both of you have made, is just by doing that, this is a business that had never donated to Centerville Day, 
and that year not only donated but <laughs> like donated the high highest amount oh. uh, and we were not expecting that and so it really does make a difference to just that whole theory management by walking around you know know, know your your base and and make them feel supported and uh, and that you care about them. So I'm assuming your thoughts are probably the same vein. You three have hit the nail on the head. I agree with you 100%. It's that personal approach. Um, I have nothing to add. You've covered the bases. <laughs> Keep doing it. Get your other council people out there and staff people out there and touch base. And it's that personal approach that I think really makes a difference and leaves an impression, clearly with that business and then their reaction to you know, Centerville Day. So, so on a uh, less positive note, the question I'd like to ask next uh, as we kind of round out the, the final questions here. Um, so what are the current impediments to our success? And maybe instead of making it personal to the town, what are sort of generalizable impediments that municipalities throughout the nation, throughout the world might be uh, experiencing that we should sort of have at the top of our mind to just make sure that we're aware of these potential impediments, we're actively addressing them. Heather, maybe I'll start with you. What are or some of the sort of low-hanging fruit that can get folks in trouble if you're not really working to address well, those? Well, I mean, currently some of those, some of them are out of our hands, you know, the, the national economy. Um, the fact that you know to build something probably costs three times as much as it did five years ago you know the carrying cost as well um, so looking at the national some of those things are just out of our hands and those that want to do business that can't afford that are going to keep on going and, and those that can are going to wait um, i would say infrastructure is something that you're going to hear from all towns whether whether it's water and sewer whether it's roads whether it's internet that is a common theme that I've heard. I would also say workforce and workforce development, being able, you know, if you, no matter what, what it is, whether it's retail or, or warehouse or whatever, to be able to find the employees is, is something that's really important. And um, for retail, it's going to be the focus of the, the citizens, wherever it is, to be able to support that retail. You know, they, a lot of times you hear, we, we need this, we need this, and then it comes, and then it's not supported by the, the town, and, you know, for whatever reasons, but then they, they're unable to stay. But I would say a lot of it's, you know, kind of outside of what the town can control, what they can control inside is the business environment and the culture and the acceptance and you know just like you said walking in to say hi and um, let them know that they're valued within that's how you're going to get them to stay but um, which outweighs some of the the national side of things that are out of your control but infrastructure is number one um, I agree that infrastructure is a huge part of that um, we, we have to be honest though about Centerville we pay two taxes we pay town tax, we pay county tax. Um, that's not always the easiest pill to swallow when you're trying to set up a business, but it is what it is. Um, so that, in my mind, is, is a pretty major impediment, but it's one of those things we really can't control. Other than getting more, what do they call it, set aside from the county uh, <laughs> back. How do I control bees, that? So, yeah. <laughs> Please, tell them to double, triple it. <laughs> All right. Um, Kind of a final question to um, to ask uh, that gets us back to uh, the title slide that that's behind us here tonight. You know, what does this town of Centerville look like in five to ten years? Um, so I'll take it a little bit further out, and I'll ask each of you. We'll start with Heather. Where where do we want to be in ten to twenty years? What does that look like? I'd say that that answer comes from your comprehensive plan, which is currently being updated, as well as the economic development plan that was done in 2015, because the citizen input, and as well as your you know, council and uh, business community, is really important to look at what the vision should be. Um, you do have product that shovel ready, ready to roll. So, you know, and, and projects like that take five to 10 years to, to fully build out. We certainly hope it doesn't work that way, but that's just how it works. Um, so you've got some product, you can see some change. I also um, envision continued redevelopment of your downtown, you know, your infill of your vacant spaces, um, using the sustainable communities funding and, and the money that Carol has for the facade improvements to, um, 
make what you have even better. So there's great opportunity, even even with potential limited infrastructure and um, you know the, the cost of everything being so high. There's still plenty that can, Centerville can do. I see the downtown continuing to be invigorated, and I see this uh, commercial property um, that Davis has being a great economic driver. Um, I've I've seen in some of the plans in the past. I haven't read the current one. Um, yet is looking at future annexation and what that means because you you are very close to 213 um, and three or 301 sorry 301 and what that means for you as far as commercial development uh, retail development access for um, individuals to to see you from the the roadway but um, seven to ten years you've got some growth that can happen yes. that's currently there for the taking Davis, what are you thinking? Yeah, I, uh, you know, my property uh, certainly would you know, hope that it is uh, pretty much filled out and built out, <laughs> and for sure, um, and that um, you, you know our our scale is such that it's I, I think it's appropriate for where we're we're situated in town. I mean, I certainly uh, we could put a big. A, a big box say warehouse of you know 200,000 feet or something in there but I, I don't know that that would be that would be a special purpose you know somebody that would need to be there for some reason whether it be a food service you know climate control kind of thing I just don't see that as a practical you know distribution hub for say an Amazon or a last mile facility location or something like that um, and uh, I think I'd get some pushback, you know, from residents and that, you know, that's just the scale of that is kind of hard to fathom you know, on this property. But if it's if it's built out and, uh, you know, two to say two to 10 acre chunks, I think that that's that's kind of what, what I'm foreseeing. And to Heather's point, you know, the land out here. You know the 304 and out to 301 sure i mean over there by tidewater you could put a half million square foot warehouse if you wanted to um and uh i don't know that you would necessarily get a lot of uh negative you know from somebody about it, it that that's appropriate out there i mean it's near the highway it's it's right on the, the main drag so that that's not what we had in, envisioned for this land at all it just uh it just seemed like a good opportunity to kind of grow on what we had started here. And, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, certainly having the infrastructure worked out um, where the water and sewer uh, capacity is, is raised is going to be very beneficial. Um, and, um, yeah, I, it would be great to really get a, a good mixed use of, of companies and facilities in here to kind of match the zoning that it's intended for. Um, yeah, would I, you know, want to do the rest of it as, a, you know, an outdoor grow facility for a marijuana produ production? I, no. I mean, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, I'm sure that wasn't in anyone's, I mean, 10 years ago, that was unimaginable. And look what happened. I mean, so, um, but we'll see. Um, We've got some inquiries, and you know we'll keep working them, and hopefully bear some fruit. Yes, sir. Here's to it. Yeah. And Pat. Um, I agree with everything just said. Um, I want to say from the comprehensive plan update, um, which we've been working on at the Planning Commission for a bit here, um, one of the big things that we've talked about is transportation into town through town. Um, we would need to work out something very specifically with State Highway for signalization, if you will, of traffic on 213 for new development in the business park. There's also a suggestion of some additional roadways to be um, enhanced or extended to be able to, say, Taylor Mill Road to be able to take traffic oops, over to, um, you know, this location, actually. So something like that would have to be looked at very seriously, because um, otherwise that could be an impediment. Um, and I'm, I mentioned earlier about having a good mixed-use development on the vacant land side of Pennsylvania Avenue. I think that, in my mind, that's low-hanging fruit in terms of something that could be out 
be put out there to the development community. And I, I would hope that we would have that done in the next so many years. And also uh, the business park developed as well as Dave has described it. And I think that's about it. I, I, I think that there's a lot that we can do and, and a lot we can accomplish. And again, that wastewater treatment plant is key to get that built out. We do have some capacity remaining, not a whole lot, but that is truly key to any exactly. future plants. I know, Davis, you have some allotment for the business park. Yeah, yeah, I do. But, it, you know, one big, uh, if it's a processing use or a hotel use, uh, that's Wipes pretty much going to wipe it it'll all out. It'll take it out, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, if so it's, we need that. If it's, uh, right you know, smaller uses that don't have a, a large uh, need, then sure. But right. yeah, it's only gonna take one to come in and and pretty much gobble it all up. Right. So we're about there. So I, I wanna thank the panelists and before we close, we'll see if uh, we have anybody in the audience here today that would like to ask a question. Do we have, oh, we do have one. So if you'll uh, state your name, tell us where you live. And then I'm Jamie your... Johnson, Little Kidwell Avenue. Um, I'm just curious, uh, any updates on the Taco Bell? The, uh, I know the uh, franchisee has been circulating uh, their plans. Uh, I've signed the uh, land plat. That it's a little one-acre parcel next door to the Dunkin' Donuts. That's being circulated, to my knowledge. The, their civil engineer is circulating it amongst the the town i know the planning commission head has to sign off on it yeah we've we've approved the development yeah and, yeah. and it, I, as far as i know all the approvals are in place I, I i have no reason to think that it's not going to go forward unless something catastrophic happens but they're um tentatively uh, i would expect at least the uh the project to, the land uh, acquisition to happen even as soon as the end of this month and once that's done, and I, I don't know why they would not begin construction this summer, I, unless they have other plans. And but uh, it, I fully intended to be moving forward. Okay, thank you. So before we close, I'll just um, provide some parting thoughts. I when I, when I thought about this event tonight and and all the things that we might discuss. Um, I kind of prepared myself for what I think the town can and should look like five to ten years and beyond. And I think the discussion tonight really helped flavor that and reflavor that for me as a member of the council. And I would just add these parting words. I would like to see a community that, uh, in spite of being a bedroom community, because I think sometimes that's a uh, an albatross around our neck. Um, we, we've got a lot of folks that, that travel across the Bay Bridge. They might be sitting in beach traffic, and then they get home, and they, all they want to do is eat dinner and relax. And it's hard for a lot of members of this community to be active and to attend council meetings to know what's going on. And, and I think in some ways that contributed to uh, the Royal Farms, the, the, the amendment for our uh, convenience store square footage, that if we had passed that amendment, it would have allowed Royal Farms to proceed. Um, we had you know a huge percentage of the community up in arms. And what was interesting was if you really paid attention to the feedback, there were those that, you know, it was, hell no, I don't want Royal Farms here. But you put those few aside, it really was folks saying, I didn't understand what was going on and I wanted more information. I, I wanted to have an opportunity to hear from the developer the way we have in, in previous projects like Carter Farm. And so I know as, as one of the five council members, I want to see us do a better job when we have folks that are interested that might come through us from county uh, referrals or Davis's potential projects and developers uh, that were in a better position to advocate for and host such sessions uh, as, as the council uh, and as the the town staff uh, so that we really encourage some uh, active dialogue uh, so that folks can take an interest and be informed and then potentially be more on board to support um, and I'd like to see us try some of these innovative uh, graduated uh, uh, tax scenarios um, I'd like to see us be able to potentially market the, the fast tracking capability that we may have as compared to folks on the other side of the Bay Bridge. Um, I'd like to see us change the trajectory and, and get to a point where we flip our residential versus commercial tax base. Um, I think we can get there. Um, I think it's a multifaceted 
uh, process, I think it's worth looking potentially at uh, a privatization effort. There's there's some growing interest among some of the strong business leaders that we have uh, from our existing business establishments. So I have a sneaky suspicion that that's going to happen and, and sooner than we think. Um, but I think it's all of these things combined, and quite frankly, it's having great folks like those sitting here on this panel tonight who are willing to take their time at 7 to 8.30 p.m. it is now. Um, and so we really appreciate everybody tonight. And uh, for those at, at home, you know, stay involved and ask questions. Come to our council meetings. Uh, get involved in whatever way you can, and we're going to continue to push forward with a strong economic development mission for the town of Centerville. Thank you, and good night. Thank <music> you.